Hello and welcome to chapter two. Hope you uh, enjoyed chapter one. It was a, one of the longer lectures, uh, trying to motivate you a little bit. Um, and now we're going to kind of go back to the basics. Uh, the chapter chapter one covered sort of the first four to five chapters of the book. So um, as always, these uh, this video, these slides are copyright, Creative Commons, attribution, as well as the audio. And so. Now we're going to talk about sort of the really low-level things that make up the Python language. Um, constants. So I'm going to some of this is terminology just so I can like say the word constant and you won't freak out. Uh, constant is as contrasted with something that changes is variable. We'll talk about variables in the next slide, but for now, constants. Constants are in things that are sort of natural and instinctive. Things like uh, numbers, 123. 98.6 or hello world and so in in what, what I'm doing here is we're we're using the Python interpreter and that how you, that's how you can tell the Chevron prompt and I'm saying print 123 and then Python responds with 123 print 98.6 Python responds with 98.6 and print single quote hello world single quote so the constants are the 123 98.6 and quote hello world quote so these are things we can use either single quotes or double quotes to uh, make strings. And so programs kind of work with numbers and work with strings, and we have these non-varying values that we call constants. So the other side of the picture is the variable. And the way I like to characterize a variable is it's a place in the memory of the computer. Uh, we give it a name as a programmer. We pick the variable name. In this I'm saying x equals 12.2 and uh, y equals 14. I am choosing the name and I'm choosing what to put in there. Uh, this is a statement called an assignment statement. And the way to think of the assignment statement is that it sort of has a direction. We're saying, dear Python, go find some memory. I will use the label x later to, re to refer to that memory and take the number 12.2 and stick it into x then this is sequential code, then the next thing I want you to do is I'd like you to go find some more memory, call it Y, I will call it Y later, and uh, stick 14 in there. Okay, and so that ends up sort of with two little areas of memory, you know, one labeled X, and here's a little cell in which we'd like a drawer or something, and one labeled Y, and we put have 12.2 after these lines run, we have 12.2 in one and 14 in the other. Then, for example, if there's another line that's down here, so there's this third line after this has happened, after this has happened, x equals 100. Remember, this has kind of got an, a direction to it. Say, oh, remember that x that I had? You know, I would like now to put 100 in that. So as I'm thinking this through, I think of that as sort of removing the 12.2 or overwriting the 12.2 and putting 100 in its place. And so at the end here, X is left with 100 and Y is left with, one four, uh, with, with 14. So these variables can kind of have one value in them, and but we can look at them and we can reuse them and put different values in if we want. There's some rules for naming your variables. Again, you get to pick the variable names. Um, often we pick variables that make some sense. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, in Python, uh, variables can start with an underscore. We tend not to, as normal programmers, use those. We let libraries use those. Um, it has to have letters, numbers, and underscores, and and uh, start with uh, start with a letter or an underscore. A case matters, so uh, spam is good. Eggs is spam good. Spam twenty three is good because the number is not the first character underscore speed, that's also perfectly fine because it starts with an underscore or a letter. <coughs> 23 spam starts with a letter, uh, starts with a number, so that's bad. This starts with something other than a letter or a underscore. And you can't use a dot in the, in the variable name. It turns out the dot has meaning to Python that would confuse it. That would confuse it and wouldn't understand <clears throat> what we really mean there, and so that would be a syntax error. That would be syntax error. Um, because case is sensitive, that means that things like all lowercase spam is different than a uppercase s and all uppercase. These are three distinct variables that are unique. 
um, most people don't you choose variables that might be so confusing. So this to you as you write it and as to anybody that might read it would find three variables named as very confusing. So it's a bad idea. Don't do it. But I'm just showing you as an example that case can make a variable name distinct. And again, this variable is a place in memory that we are going to store and retrieve uh, information, whether it be numbers or strings or whatever. These are things that we control. Now, Python also has a set of reserved words. And what it really means is you can't use these for variables. These words have very special meaning. And, for, is, raise, if. So you can't make a variable named if. It'll be like, oh no, that is if. I know what if is. And so these are words that Python has as its core vocabulary and forbids you to use them for other purposes like variable names or later function names. So that's kind of the vocabulary, constants, variables, and uh, reserved words. Now, we take these and we start assembling them into sort of sentences, statements, Python statements that do something. So we've already talked about an assignment statement. It has kind of an arrow here that says, hey, Python, go find me a place called x. Take the number 2 and stick it in there for later, then continue on. Now, because there's, a, there's an arrow, the right side of this is done first. And so, it's a, so this right side, you can kind of ignore for the moment the left-hand side, and it calculates the right-hand side by looking at the current value for x, which happens to be 2. Then it adds these two things together and then gets 4. And then, at the point where it knows 4, that this number is 4, it will then store that back into x. And so then, later, we print x, and we will get the 4. And so, again, this is a sequence of steps, and the, the variable x changes as these steps continue. And when we're saying print x, that really means print the current value for x. So, Operator, we can do a number of different operators in assignment statements. We calculate this right-hand side. This is sort of all calculated, whatever this is, based on the current value for x, does this calculation. And then when it knows what the answer is, it assigns that into the variable that's on the left-hand side of the assignment statement. Again, calculate the right-hand side completely and then move it to the left-hand side. Some early languages actually didn't use the equal sign for the assignment operator, this assignment operator, and in a way it kind of, get a good color here. Um, some languages, an early language, actually used an arrow. Arrows aren't really on people's keyboards. Uh, another language used colon equals as this assignment operator. But we use equals. Now, if you're familiar with math, this can be a little confusing, like x equals 1, and then x equals 2. That, as mathematics, would be bad math, because in a proof or a problem, x can only have one value. But in programming, if this was two statements, that means just x had a value, and then the value for x changed later. OK, so just kind of go through this. Because it's working from the right-hand side to the left-hand side on assignment statements, it is pulling out these x values. So x may have 0.6. It pulls the values out before it's sort of ignoring this part right here. And it's just going to try to resolve this expression. And it has multiplication and parentheses and things like that. So it basically pulls the 0.6 into the calculation, does the 1 minus x, which gives you 0.4. Then it multiplies these three things together, giving 0.93. And then when it is all done with all of that, it takes that, oops, takes that 0 0.93 and then puts it back into x. And so this is just sort of emphasizing how the right hand side is computed to produce a value, then it is moved into the variable. In, and that is why you can have sort of x on both sides, because this is like the old and this is the new. This is the old x participates in the calculation, and then when the calculation is done, it becomes the new x. Hope that makes sense. So this on the right hand side here is a numeric expression. So we have a number of different operators. Some of them are instinctive, intuitive, um, the plus and the minus. The reason some of these are so weird is in the really old days, we didn't have too many things on the keyboard. And a, a lot of programs were very mathematical. And so they figured out what was on the keyboard of the computer equipment of the day. And then they had to uh, 
fake certain things. So it turns out that plus and minus were on the keyboard, and so plus and minus are addition and subtraction respectively. There was no kind of times operator for multiplication, and dot was used for decimal points, so they used asterisk for multiplication. So in computers, languages, nearly all of them, uh, they basically use a multi a times for multiplication. Slash is used for division, so we say like 8 slash 2, which is 8 divided by 2. Um, raising something to the power, like a 4 squared, that is double asterisk. And then remainder is if you uh, do a division, uh, that gives you the remainder rather than the divisor. So 8 over 2 is 4, remainder 0. So the remainder is what you get with this particular operator. There's a few cool things that we can do with remainder that we won't talk about right away, but uh, it's there. And so here's just a couple of uh, sample expressions. Um, let's get me green. Okay. So so again, I'm using the Python interpreter, so you can kind of just is just the prompt. These chevrons are the prompt. Uh, create the variable xx and assign it to two. Uh, retrieve the old value in an addition, then print it out, and put it back into xx, so xx has 4. yy, this is a multiplication, 440 times 12 is 5,280. yy over 1,000, now this is a little counterintuitive. This, because yy is an integer, it then does it in a truncated division, and so 5,280 divided by 1,000 is 5. Now, if and, and so that's that's an integer division. We'll see in a second about floating point division. Um, now we take the variable jj and we set it to 23. And now we're going to use the modular or modulo or remainder operator to say what is jj, what is the remainder when we divide this jj by 5. And so if you think about this, we take old long division, 23 divided by 5, you end up with 4 and then remainder 3. The modulo operator, or the percent, or the remainder operator, gives us back this number. And so that's why kk is 3. It is the remainder of 23 when divided by 5, or the remainder of the division of 5 into 23. And the raising to the power, 4 cubed, no, that's not so nice, 4 cubed is 4 star star 3. And so that ends up being 64. So that's just operations. Now, just like in algebra and mathematics, um, we have rules about when to, uh, when, which operations happen first. In general, things like uh, the power happens before the multiplication and division, and then the addition and subtraction happen. And so there are some rules that when you're looking at an expression and trying to calculate what its value is, if you don't have parentheses, it follows these rules. And so the the, most, the, the, the rule that sort of trumps all the rules is that parentheses are always respected. So a lot of us just write these with parentheses in place, even sometimes though you don't need it. Then after parentheses have been handled, then it does exponentiation. Then it does multiplication, division, and remainder. And then it does addition and subtraction. And then when it, all else being equal, it just works left to right. So let's, let's look through an example. So here is a calculation that is, you know, one, 1 plus 2 times 3 divided by 4 over 5. And the question is, what order does this happen? Okay. And so let's, let's sort of take a look at this. And so we start with, uh, are there any parentheses? And the answer is no, there are no parentheses. So let's go next. Um, power. And so the, the power says, OK, let's look across and find those things that are raised to a power. And the 2 cubed, or 2 to the third power, is the, the power. So we're going to do that one. Okay, And then we can, the way I do it when I'm sort of doing these slowly is I rewrite it. So the 2 to the third power becomes 8. So it's 1 plus 8 over 4 times 5. And then now we can say, oh, power, that's taken care of. Now we're going to do multiplication and division. And we go across. Now, we have both a division and a multiplication. Okay, and multiplication and division are done at the same time. So that means we do left to right, which means we do the first one that we encounter first. And so that will be 8 over 4 because of the left to right rule. 
And so we find that one, and that's the one that gets computed next, and that turns into 2. And again, I like to rewrite these expressions just to keep my brain really, really clear. After a while, you just do it in your head. But I rewrite them when I was first learning it. At least I rewrote it all the time. And, uh, and so next, looking at this, there's a multiplication. We're not done with multiplication yet. So the 2 over 5 is the next thing. And then we do that calculation, and that becomes 10. And again, we rewrite it. And now we've done the multiplication. And we're going to do addition next, and that's just 1 over 10. And that becomes 11. And so basically, this big long thing, through a series of successive steps, becomes 11. And indeed, when we print it out, that's what we get. Okay. So there's the rules that are parentheses, power, multiplication, addition, and then left to right. But smart people usually just put parentheses in. You know, so here's this, here's an exam, oop, go back, go back. Here's an exam question. Now, I wouldn't write this code, right? I wouldn't write this code this way. I would put a parenthesis here and a parenthesis there. It's the same thing. Because that's exactly the 2 times 3 is going to happen, and the 4 over 5 is going to happen, and then the plus and the minus will happen left to right. But why not make it easier on your readers and just put the parentheses in? Because they're redundant. They're not necessary, but away you go. Now, if you don't want it to happen in that order, of course, then you have to put parentheses. If you want the addition to happen before the multiplication, then you have to put parentheses in, which you can't. But we tend to recommend that you use more parentheses rather than less parentheses. Now, Python integer division in Python 2, which we are using Python 2 for this class. There's a new Python 3 that the world is slowly transitioning to, and a lot of people are using it in teaching. Um, but it's not as common sort of in the real world with libraries and utilities. And so we'll stick with Python 2 for a few more years until Python 3 uh, really kind of turns the corner. Um, it's nice to have it there, but there's so much Python and it's so popular, Python 2, that it's uh, just kind of hard to get everybody up to Python 3. So in Python 2, integer division truncates, and you saw that before, um, where I did the 5,280 by 1,000 and I got 5 as it. And, but we can look at a couple of examples that make this really very quite, quite clear. So 10 divided by 2 is 5, as you would expect. 9 divided by 2 is 4. Not exactly what you'd expect. You kind of expect that to be 4.5 instead of 4. But in Python 3, it will be 4.5. But for now, in Python 2, 9 over, 9 over 2 is 4. And um, 99 over 100 is 0. Now, that seems rather counterintuitive, but it is a truncating division. It's not a rounding division. It's a truncating division. Now, interestingly, if you make either of these numbers have a decimal, make them what we call floating point numbers, um, then the division is done in floating point. So 10.0 over 2.0 is 5.0. Now, these are different. This is an integer number, and this is a floating point number. It's 5.0. And then 99.0 over 100.0 is exactly as you would expect, and it's a floating point number. So. Now, you can also mix integers and floating point numbers as you go. So here we have 99 over 100. Those are both integers, integer, integer. And, or, and that comes out with 0 because it's truncating. Now, if we have an integer and a floating point number, 99 over 100.0, then that comes out as 0 0.99. And either one, if we have 99 over 100, that's a floating point, and that's an integer, we still end up with a floating point. So this is a floating point, floating point. And even in complex expressions, as it evaluates when it sees an integer, so the first thing it would evaluate is this would become a 6. So it would be 1 plus 6 over 4.0 minus 5. Then it would be doing this 6 over 4.0, and that would be 1.5, 1 plus 1.5 minus 5. And so this is an integer, and that's a floating point, and the result becomes a floating point. And then the rest of the calculation is done floating point to the point where the ultimate is a floating point negative 2.5. So you can throw a floating point into a calculation, and as soon as the calculation touches the floating point, the remainder of the calculation is done in floating point. 
kind of converts it to floating point, but it doesn't want to convert it back because it considers floating point sort of the more general of the representations. So here we are talking about integers and floating points. These are a concept in programming languages and in Python called type. Variables and constants have a type. We can see that if you say 1 versus 1.0, they have different, they, it works different, it functions differently. And so Python keeps track of both variables and literals slash constants and having them have a type. And we've seen this, right? Now the interesting thing is, is Python is very aware of the type and can use the same syntax to accomplish different things. So if we look at this line here where we say dd equals 1.4, well, it looks at the 1 and looks at the 4 and says, oh, those are two integers. I will add those together and give you a 5. So it gives you an integer, an integer, and an integer comes back. Okay, And then ee -E equals hello plus there. Well, these are two strings, hello and there. And it says, hmm, this must be a concatenation. All right, so I'm going to concatenate those together because those are strings, and I know how to concatenate strings, and that's kind of like string addition, right? And so we see a hello there as a result. Now, the interesting thing is where did this space come from? Let me change colors here. Where, oops. Where did that space come from? Well, the plus does not add the space. There's a space right there, and that's the space. So I can concatenate it hello space plus there, and that's how I got hello there. But the key thing is, is this plus operator, clear. This plus operator looks to either side and says, oh, they're strings. I think you mean concatenation. Here, it looks either side and says, oh, those are integers. I think you mean addition. So Python is very aware of type, and type informs Python what you really mean. And so it looks like those are kind of the same, but they're quite different operations. So the type can get you in trouble. Remember, Python is looking at the type. So here we have a little problem, our first traceback first of many tracebacks. So here we have uh, EE, -E, which is hello there, which is exactly what we did. This is a string and this is a string, so EE -E should be a string. And then we try to add one to it. And again, Python is saying, oh, I see an, a plus sign here. So I'm look over here, yeah, that's a string. And we'll look over here and that's an integer. It's like, ah, and this is a traceback. Now, here's a good time to talk about tracebacks. Tracebacks, I color them red because you might think that Python dislikes you or thinks that you're you know, unworthy of its brilliance. And certainly the way these things are worded, it sounds like you know, the, you're know you being scolded. It's like, hey, type error. You can, cannot concatenate stir and int objects, right? That's I'm, I'm scolding you. You're bad, bad programmer. And it does feel a bit like you're scolded. But if you go back to lecture one, this is also the moment where really we shouldn't think of this as like scolding. We should think of this as Python sort of asking for help. It's like, wow, you gave me this line and I, Python, have no idea. In all your greatness, could you give me some possible clue as to what you really mean for me to do because I'm so lost and given that I'm Python and I'm lost and you are the only purpose for my existence, uh, I must stop until you give me better guidance. So don't look at tracebacks as scolding. They sound like scolding. I'll stop coloring them red after a while. So if Python is so obsessed with the type of things, you should be able to ask Python what the type of something is. And so there's a built-in function called type. This is part of the Python language, type parenthesis, and you can put a variable in here. What's the type of the variable EE? -E? And it says, oh, yeah, I know what that is. That would be a string. And then you can also put a constant in here and say, what's the type of quote, hello, quote? And that's a string, too. And what's the type of the number one? Well, that would be an integer. So it's picky about the type, but it'll also share with you what it believes the type is. And there's several types of numbers. As I've already mentioned, there are integers, which are the whole numbers. They can be positive and negative and zero. And then there are the decimal numbers, the floating point numbers, like 98.6 or negative 2.5 or 14.0. Python knows these as well because it does division different if it's presented with two integers or an integer and a float or a float and a float. 
And so here we have x is 1, and we say, what is it? It's an integer. And we say it's 98.6, and we say, well, what's that? It's a float. And you can ask for both variables and constants. So what's the type of 1? It's an integer. And what's the type of 1.0? And it's a float. You can also convert types. It has a bunch of type conversion functions built into it. So there's an implicit conversion going on when you're sort of saying, you know, divide an integer by a floating point. It says, OK, I see. I look to the sides, and I will make the, con I will make the conversion for you. But you can also be explicit. So in this case, we're going to say, Take this 99 and convert it to a floating point version of itself, which is 99.0, and then do the division. So Python looks out here and goes, oh, after that, that's a float, and that's an integer if I look over here. And then that means that the result is a float, and the division is done as a float. So we are force converting the 99 integer into a 99.0 float. And we can even do this like and just stick it in a variable. So we can put 42 in i, and that is an integer. Then we can say, hey, convert float that i into a float and stick it into the variable f. And so we can print it. And now it's 42.0 instead of 42. Right? They're not the same. They're both kind of 42, but one is a floating point 42, and the other is an integer 42. And we can ask, and that is a float. And you can also do the same thing in the middle of a calculation, where you have 1 plus 2 times float of 3. This float is done quickly. So the first thing that happens, this is 1 plus 2 times 3.0, over 4, minus 5. So the first thing that happens is these floats are done, because they're parentheses, so they matter. So this is a built-in function called float that takes, as its argument, a non-floating point number and gives you back a floating point number. We'll talk more about functions in chapter 4. You can also convert between strings and numbers. And, uh, and if you recall, I, we did the example where we tick a string. In this case, I'm being a little confusing because I'm making a string with the characters 1, 2, 3. Now this is not the same as 123. This is a three-character string with 1, 2, 3 in it. And I can ask what kind of thing is in there, and it says, oh, there's a string in there. I know about that. And then I can try to add 1 to it. And it seems intuitive that, quote, 1, 2, 3 plus 1 would be somehow 124. But it's not. Python takes a look at the plus and says, oh, there's a string on that side and an integer on that side. I am going to freak out and tell you that you cannot concatenate a string and an integer. But there is an int function that converts various things, including strings, to an integer. So we can give as its parameter, its input, the string value. Then it converts it to an integer. And then we'll put the result in the variable iVal. We can ask what the type of that is. It's an I, it's a integer. And now we can use it in an expression, print iVal plus 1. And so now Python looks to both sides, sees an integer, sees an integer, and gets 124. Voila. Now, if I make a new variable and I stick hello Bob in it, and I say, hey, let's convert hello Bob to an integer, as you might expect, it blows up. And it says invalid literal for int. These, these tracebacks, again, once you kind of get used to the kind of harsh wording of them, because they're not saying, sorry, comma, they're trying to tell you what's going on. So cannot concatenate string and integer and invalid literal for int. It's trying to be as helpful as it possibly can be to give you a clue as to what to fix. So again, not scolding. OK, so that's variables and types and type conversion. Now we'll talk a little bit about user input. And uh, there's a function that's built into Python called raw input. And what happens when raw input runs is it it has as one of its parameters a prompt, which is something that shows up on the screen. Who are you? And then it waits, sits and waits. It says, what next? And then you type a string, da, 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 and then you hit the enter key, the enter key. And then whatever you typed here goes into a variable. And it is a string, and 
then you then you can use it. So I'm going to print the string welcome, comma. So that means I'm printing two things now. The comma adds a space between welcome and then nam. And so welcome is a literal, and then Chuck is coming from this nam variable. So this is a two-line program. And I think this is one of your assignments actually. To uh, well, it's one of the exercises in the book to uh, prompt for a user's name and then welcome them. Okay. So raw input is a function that issues a prompt, waits, and then takes whatever string that's entered and then returns it and then puts it into that variable. So now we're going to create kind of the first useful program. It's not a powerful program. It is a, an interesting problem of uh, the fact that for some reason um, there's a difference in the numbering scheme of United States elevators and European elevators. Uh, European elevators, uh, the floor that you walk out on is the zero floor. The floor above that is the one floor and the floor below that, the basement, is the minus one floor. And so you walk in and you can either go up the elevator or down the elevator. Of course in the United States, the floor that you walk in is the one and then there's the two floor above that, and then there's like the basement. So this is the this is the imagination that the Americans have as to how to number floors. All right, the Europeans go zero, one, minus one. So children who go to hotels learn instantly the notion of zero and the notion of positive and negative numbers and the symmetry between positive and negative numbers. I mean, I just wish the United States hotels would switch to this. To teach young people zero immediately and negative numbers. So we somehow think that numbers all in the United States start at one and then there are no no negative numbers, there's the basement. I wonder why that is. But whatever. For people who travel a lot, they may be confused by this. They need a way to convert back and forth between the US and European numbering system. So this is a simple program that demonstrates a real classic pattern of input processing and output. It's just three lines, but it has the essential things that all programs that are useful, they generally read some data, do some work with the data, and then produce some kind of results. And so, so the first line is a raw input that effectively that puts out a prompt and then it waits. It says, please enter your Europe floor. It sits there. We type a zero. Then zero goes into imp, but it is a string. It's not a number. It is a string. So we can't add to it. But we can take and convert it to an integer with the int function, int of imp. That's a string being converted to an integer. So now it's a real numeric zero. And we can add one to that. And we sum that together. We put it in to the variable USF, and then we print US floor, comma, and then whatever the variable for USF is, and out comes US floor one. So we've written a very simple elevator floor conversion from a European floor to a United States floor. Don't ask about negative numbers, it's not really good at that, but from zero and positive numbers, it works great. So another thing to uh, think about in any programming language is comments. Comments are like commentary, come, you know, and, and, and basically it's a way for us to uh, add notations for ourselves or for other humans interspersed in the code. And so in Python, anything after a pound sign is ignored. You can have a pound sign at the beginning of the line and then the whole line is ignored. There are two or three reasons why you can do this. One is sort of like paragraph headings where you can say what's going to happen in English um, or, or your language. And you can write documentation that says this code was written by Charles Severance December 2010. Um, and you can also just hide a line of code to test and, and turn it on and off without actually deleting the line of code. It's a real common thing in, in debugging. So for example, here is a here is a, the program that we've been playing with. This is our word counting program that we've been talking about from the beginning. And here is an example of four comments 
one, two, three, four, four comments that basically tell us what these paragraphs are going to do. Now they don't have any effect on the program whatsoever, but this one says get the name of the file and open it. Kind of helpful, right? Count the word frequency, that's what this little bit does. Find the most common word, that's what this little bit does. And all done, print this out. So it's really can be very helpful just to add a little tiny bit of stuff. You don't want to overuse comments. You don't want to say like x equals 12. Take 12 and put it into x. Sometimes people teach you and try to say, oh, you need a one comment every three lines. I don't believe in any of those rules. I basically say, if it's useful to describe it, then describe it. So that's comments. So uh, <clears throat> some operators apply to strings. We've already talked about plus. It's kind of silly, although useful in places. You can actually multiply strings. Where this is the, the asterisk looks and says, I got a string and an integer, and it prints out the string five times. Not a lot of use for that. Now, let's talk a little bit about choosing variable names. This is something that is really confusing. So I said like x equals 1, x equals x plus 1. What does x mean? And the answer is, it doesn't mean anything. I chose it. I wanted to make a variable, and so I picked x. We pick x a lot, probably because we learned in algebra in sixth grade that x was a variable. So, and it's short, and so why not call it x? But as your programs get larger, this gets kind of frustrating to have all your variables like x and y and z. And so the notion of mnemonic, it means memory aid, we choose our variable names wisely, so they remind us of what the variable's going to do internally. And so, it, as I go through this lecture, in the beginning, if I choose a variable that's so, too clever, you're going to think that it's part of the language. And so I sort of switch back and forth between well-chosen variable names and stupid variable names to kind of re-emphasize the notion that I can choose. Mnemonic is a good practice. Okay, so here we go. Let's take a look at a bit of code. So the question is, what is this code doing? What will it even print out? Is it syntactically correct? Now you could probably cut and paste this into, your brow into Python and figure out that it is syntactically correct. There are three variables. This one here, and this one here match. This one here, and that one there match. And these two match. So it's taking these two numbers and multiplying together and then printing out the product of the two numbers. If you're real careful and like look at every, very, every character. Now, this would be called non-mnemonic variables. They're really messy. Now, Python, it's happy. Because all it wants is to say, oh, here's the name that I, the programmer, decided I wanted to call this piece of memory, and I'll refer to it down here. Okay? And so Python's happy. Now, if you hand this to another human being, they're going to be really unhappy because they're going to be like, what are you doing? So one better way to write it would be to make the variables very simple, and then cognitively we humans can figure out which is which. Because again, it's still only about matching. The A has to match the A, the B matches the B, and the C's match. It's actually the exact same program. A equals 35, B equals 12.5, C equals A times B, and print C. It is these, Python sees these as the same program. It doesn't care what we name them. Now a human will be much appreciative if you say, here, you can either have this one or this one, this one will make them a lot happier. Woo. Okay, so that is certainly cognitively easier, but it's not really giving you any sense of what's going on here. Right? So an even better way to write this exact same program to do the exact same thing would be to choose variables named hours, rate, and pay, if indeed that is what you're doing. Now you can look at this and you go, oh, well, shoot, 35 is the number of hours and 12 and a half is the rate and the pay is the number of hours times the rate. And then we're going to print out the pay. That makes a lot of sense. So this is really 
a awesome and wonderful characterization. And this, if that's what you're doing, and if those are hours, rate, and pay, it's a great thing to name your variables. But this is where beginning students get confused. And so sometimes I'll write it this way, and sometimes I'll write it this way. Because you look at this until you get a little more sophisticated, a little more skilled, and you say, like, does Python know something about payroll? Is hours a reserved word? Is rate a reserved word and pay a reserved word? Are these things that Python knows about? And the answer is no. Python sees these three programs as exactly the same name. It's just this person really made a very bad choice of a variable name. This person made a less bad choice of a variable name. And this person made a really awesome choice of a variable name. So the only difference between these two things is style. They are the exact same program. And Python is equivalently happy with these. But humans are most happy when the variables are easy to remember and they are somewhat descriptive of what their expected contents will be. That's mnemonic to help you remember what you were meaning to do when you write the program. This is still a bit cryptic. Having these really short one character variable names is still a bit cryptic. So you have a couple of uh, assignments at the end of the chapter. One of the assignments is to write a program to prompt the user for hours and rate per hour and compute pay. So I won't do this here, but just a couple of sort of uh, things. Um, you're going to be using raw input. But remember that hands a string in. So you're going to have to use float the function to convert it to a floating point number so you can actually do a calculation. And then you're going to have to use multiplication and print. So multiplication and then print. So it's some combination of raw input, float, multiplication, and print constructed to, to make your program do exactly this. So this is the end of uh, chapter two. We talked about types, reserved words, variables, the mnemonic how you choose variable names. We'll hit this a couple more times because choosing variable names is always problematic. Operators, operator precedence, which just means like does multiplication happen before plus, parentheses. Integer division is a little weird because it truncates, whoop, truncates, right? Nine over 10, nine over 10 equals zero. That's the integer division truncating. Conversion, this is like the int float. And then user input, which is raw input. And then comments, which are ways for you to add human readable text to your program. Okay? See you next lecture.